Please take your seats. The forum will begin in 10 minutes.
Please take your seats. The forum will begin in five minutes. Be sure to silence your phone and know that any audio or video recording of this event is prohibited. Thank you for attending today's forum. Please silence your phone. The program will begin shortly. Be sure to silence your phone and know that any audio or video recording of this event is prohibited.
Welcome the president of the Iowa Farmers Union, Aaron Lehman. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the Heartland Forum. My name is Aaron Lehman, in addition to being a fifth generation family farmer from central Iowa, I serve as president of the Iowa Farmers Union. We are thrilled to bring together today leading Democratic pre presidential contenders with farmers and rural residents to discuss ideas for solving the range of economic and social challenges facing our communities and beyond. Iowa Farmers Union, Open Markets Institute Action Fund, HuffPost, and the Storm Lake Times are proud sponsors of this event, and we couldn't be at a better place than Buena Vista University here in Storm Lake, Iowa. <laughs> and we couldn't be here at a better time. The current farm economy, driven by corporate consolidation in agribusiness and a self-imposed trade debacle, is forcing thousands of farmers closer to crisis. And the symptoms are all around us. Farm income has been dropping for over five years, and the vast majority of farmers this year are losing money in farm equity again. The average age of the Iowa farmer is over 59 years old, and the next generation has fewer options. Meanwhile, farmers are being called upon to do more and more to help clean up Iowa's waters with few incentives to do it, and farmers are facing climate issues that threaten our whole agriculture system. But at the same time, farmers continue to find creative and innovative ways to make their farms and their communities better places. Consumers continue to show they want food raised in a humane and sustainable way, and that a sound food system leads to healthy local communities. Farmers are not just dealing with these problems. Farmers are the solutions to these problems. And that is why our, our power to create solutions is more than enough to meet these challenges. We hope this event serves as a jumping off point for discussions with the candidates about the future of rural America. We're grateful to the candidates who are here today, and we look forward to hearing from all the candidates down the road. The challenge for us in the audience today is to keep an active engagement in a real civic conversation with all the candidates, the media, and the rest of our society. We should start with our neighbors and in our communities to ensure that the values of rural Iowa and family farms stay in the forefront. Thank you for joining us today, and I'd like to introduce U.S. Secretary of Agriculture and Iowa Governor Tom Vilsack. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have two and a half minutes. Two minutes and 26 seconds. I'm here tonight for a very specific reason. I'm going to caucus. I'm going to support a candidate. I want a candidate that's going to articulate a vision for rural America, specifically for rural America. And I'll give you three reasons why that's important. First of all, if a candidate can passionately discuss a vision for rural America that is bright and hopeful, then I know that he or she understands the challenges that we have faced and the enormous opportunities that exist in rural places with rural people. It is, after all, the place where most of our food comes from, where a lot of the water that we drink is impacted, where most of the feedstocks for energy comes from. It is a place that disproportionately sends sons and daughters into the military. It is a critically important place to the future of our country. So I want to know what the vision is for growing and revitalizing rural America. I also want to, to know not the plan, not the program, not the 25 points of things you're going to do, because we hear candidates talk about that all the time. In fact, we had Donald Trump talk about this, about how supportive he was with the ethanol industry. Well, we still don't have E15. We're still waiting for E15. And meanwhile, his EPA is undercutting the industry by essentially granting waivers to, quote, small refineries that are owned by Exxon and other large oil companies. We don't need plans. We need a vision that will drive and prioritize what an administration does. And finally, with a vision, we'll understand the heart 
and the soul of our candidate. You know, frankly, most people I know vote with their heart and their soul. They obviously didn't vote the last time with their brains. <laughs> we are proud of our country, and we once again want to be proud of our country's leader. So today begins a process in rural America having a conversation and discussion about an incredibly important place. And I will tell you that for my purposes, I have 2020 vision, and that vision is winning in November of 2020. Thank you very much. Bring this down a little. Good afternoon. Um, my name's Hillary Fry. I'm the executive editor of HuffPost, and we are so thrilled to be here today to be part of this conversation about issues affecting rural communities. Before we get started, um, I have some thanks to say. First to our partners, the Storm Lake Times, the Iowa Farmers Union, and Open Markets, as well as our host today, Buena Vista University, for helping us put together this event. I want to say a special thank you to the Storm Lake Police Department for providing security today and the Storm Lake community. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you all for supporting this event and being here today. Also, thanks to our special audience members today who have prepared some personal questions um, for the candidates, and we'll get to those a little later in the program. And with that, a huge thank you to the candidates who have joined us today. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Julian Castro, former Maryland Congressman John Delaney, Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, and Representative Tim Ryan of Ohio. And without further delay, I will bring out our moderators. The first does not even need an introduction for this audience, Storm Lake's own Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Art Cullen, the Storm Lake Times, Amanda Turkle, <laughs> HuffPost Washington Bureau Chief Amanda Turkle and HuffPost Senior Reporter Zach Carter. Thank you so much and enjoy the program. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Hillary, and uh, welcome to all of you to Storm Lake, the city beautiful and Buena Vista University. We're very excited that you and these fantastic candidates are here today. Uh, as Hillary said, I'm Art Cullen, editor of the Storm Lake Times, and, uh, we'll, and Zach and Amanda will be asking questions along with the audience today. We'll try and move it along as quickly as possible so the candidates can cover as much ground as they can and we can get in as many audience questions as possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest and we're very thankful that Senator Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts can be here. Thank you, Senator, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, Senator, thank you for coming today. It's uh, great to see you again. You thank were here in January. I had was. a very, very large and enthusiastic crowd yeah. here uh, on a beautiful January day in Iowa. And uh, <laughs> we're so happy to have you back. And if you could just give us a couple minutes just to tell us what your vision is for rural America and your presidential campaign. So I want an America that works not just for those at the top, but an America that works for everyone. And we have a problem right now. We have a problem all the way across, and that is this government in Washington works better and better for a thinner and thinner slice at the top. And that's felt directly in rural America. A generation ago, 37 cents out of every food dollar went into a farmer's pocket. Today, it's 15 cents. And one of the principal reasons for that has been concentration in agribusiness. So you've got these giant corporations that are making bigger and bigger profits for themselves, for their executives, for their investors, and they're putting a the squeeze on family farms, on small farms. They're doing it on the buy-in, they're doing it on the sell-in, they're doing it through vertical integration. I want to see enforcement of our antitrust laws. I've called for the breakup of these agribusinesses. 
and break up so that they not only don't have that kind of economic power so that they're wiping out competition, so they're taking all the profits for themselves and making it unsustainable for our farms, but also break up so they don't have that kind of political power. We have a Washington that kowtows to those with money and influence. And we have to fight back because we live in a democracy and it's up to all of us to decide who our government works for, who our country works for. I believe in an America that works for everybody. Thank you, That's Senator. mine. And since I'm the local yokel, I get to ask the first question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, Senator, as Aaron noted, farm income is down by half since yep. 2013. Iowa farmers are about to lose money for the sixth straight year. Corn and soybean markets are in the tank. Ag loan delinquencies are as high as they've been since the farm crisis of the mid-1980s. Suicides, especially among dairy farmers in Wisconsin, are at their highest level since then, too. Farmers need relief now because their trade disaster check, that Trump bump, is already spent. Equity is being lost as we speak. What can we do now, urgently, to provide immediate farm income relief in what is quickly becoming an emergency? Yeah, so let's start with the fact that we have just had a natural disaster, seen livestock drown, uh, grain uh, that has been stored destroyed, uh, farmers who are not gonna be able to plant their fields because the land is just too soaked. And that, as Americans, we reach out to all of our citizens when a natural disaster hits. We pass disaster relief to help anyone who's been hit by a natural disaster, and that means immediately getting help to farm country. That's number one. But number two is we have to treat this crisis seriously. And that means we've got to be willing to offer help that's meaningful now. You know, I talk about the big corporations I, I just want to make a pitch on this. We've got to start fighting back against them because the problem right now in Washington is not only is there no help for farmers, it's that Washington is on the side of making it worse day by day. Uh, the Justice Department in the, in the Monsanto Bear, uh, uh, when they wanted to, to merge, the Justice Department stepped up, had a report, said this is going to be really bad for farmers, and yet what did they do? They approved of the merger, and that just made everything harder. 20 years ago, 600 different outfits were selling seeds. Today, basically, it's six. And that means there's nobody who has to compete on price. It means the diversity goes away that farmers may want. Same kind of thing happens on the other end. And this is the part about right now. Yes, Congress could act right now, get some relief to farm country. But part of it is to stand up and fight back. For far too long, the folks who are the giant industry, uh, giants in the industry just keep calling the shots. And this administration, and for far too long, our federal government has gone along with that. So I think it's about standing our ground right now, raising our voices and fighting back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Senator, uh, yes. Iowa is one of three states that permanently takes away the right to vote for people who have been incarcerated, although the state right now is looking at changing that. Uh, I know that you support felon reenfranchisement mm -hmm. and you support a constitutional right to vote. But do you also, where do you stand on allowing people to vote even while they're serving a sentence? This is something that happens in Maine and Vermont and was true in Massachusetts up until 2000. So do you support allowing uh, felons to vote even while they're serving their sentence? So right now, I think the fight should be over felony reenfranchisement. Once someone has paid their debt to society, they're out, they're expected to pay taxes, they're expected to abide by the law, they're expected to support themselves and their families. I think that means they get a right to vote. While they're still incarcerated, I think it's a different question. And I think that's something that we could have more conversation about. So but right, I, I think where we need to have the fight right now is on felony reenfranchisement. So right now you don't have a position on whether they should do it while No, but I think we need felony reenfranchisement. When people, when people have, have had a chance, when they've served their mm -hmm. debt to society. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so at the end of Barack Obama's presidency, the Democratic Party was in its worst electoral position since the Civil War. Republicans mm -hmm. controlled all three branches of government, both chambers of Congress, 33 governor's mansions, and Democrats had seated over 900 seats in state legislatures Boy, this in the past is fun. eight years. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so here in Iowa, they've had a Republican governor since 2011, and even after a pretty good midterm election, they still control the state legislature. What policy failures from the Obama administration contributed to that political collapse, and how would you prevent them as president? So, look, I've, I think we, I've, this is what I think 2020 is going to be all about. It's about who government works for. We watch it in terms of concentration in big agribusiness. You can watch it in sector after sector, but also in the fundamental question about how we make investments in this country. So, for example, I have proposed a wealth tax. I think the top one-tenth of one percent should pay a two percent tax on the amount of wealth they have in excess of $50 million. And, yeah. And if we did that, I just want to be clear what we could do with that money. We could pay for universal child care, pre-K and pre-pre-K for every one of our babies aged zero to five in this country and still have two trillion dollars left over. Two trillion dollars to invest in America. Two trillion dollars to invest in our towns and our cities. Two trillion dollars to invest in small towns. Think about it this way, I have a big housing bill. We need to build not only in cities we need to be building in rural America, we need housing. If young families are going to move in, they need housing. They need health care to be able to support community hospitals. If community hospitals close because they have too much uncompensated care, young families can't move into communities. They can't go there if they don't have a place where babies can be born and they can take people when they get uh, sick. These are the investments. We need to reduce the student loan debt burden so people don't have to move to big cities where the wages are higher and pay it off. So I, I will now link it up to your question, okay, in the following sense, because this is what I think is wrong. For far too long, we have not gotten out and made the case for investing not in the top, but investing in the rest of America. We make that case, I believe we're going to win in 2020, and that's up and down. And even more importantly, it means that we will build the kind of momentum, the kind of grassroots movement that come January 2021, we really make the changes we need to make. Because unless we make big structural changes, we must make those big structural changes when we win to make sure that no one like Donald Trump ever gets elected president of the United States again. Okay. Thank you, Senator. And now we're going to turn to the audience. Uh, Barbara Leach, a Farmers Union member from Davenport, Iowa. Hello from the Quad Cities. <laughs> hey, Barbara. Hi, Senator Warren. In the 1970s, I was part of a coalition that helped the state legislature decide that foreign ownership wasn't allowed yep. here. In the 1980s, in the farm crisis, the legislature changed that. Now, it is not just farm land, but foreign ownership of our whole agricultural sector. There's Chinese Smithfield, Germany's Bayer, mm -hmm. Brazil's JBS. We can make a long list. My question to you is, what would you do about it? What can be done? So I've already put out a proposal that says the rest of the country should follow Iowa's lead. And that is, no foreign country should be able to purchase farmland in America. <laughs> Think about it this way. Right now, the farmland that's already in foreign ownership is, if it were all put in one place, is the size of Virginia. And that not only creates a problem for farming communities and for our food security, it creates a threat to the safety and the defense of the United States of America. And I think that's how we have to look at our farm and farm communities. Thank you, Thank Barbara. You. 
Thank you. And our next question from the audience uh, is from Carly McAndrews, who's a beginning farmer from Eastern Iowa. Go Hawks. All right. <laughs> Hi, Carly. Hey there. The average age of farmers in the U.S. is about 60 years. Uh -huh. There are young people who wish to farm, but who face serious barriers. The National Young Farmers Coalition surveyed young farmers in 2017 and found two top challenges we face are land access and crushing student loan debt. Yes. How would you work to lessen these barriers to entry for beginning farmers? Okay, so thank you for the question, Carly. You know, I should also say on this, I was born and raised in Oklahoma. Uh, my family comes from a little town called Wetumpka, Oklahoma. My grandfather ran the local hardware store, which was kind of an all-purpose store in the small town, and then it was taken over by my Uncle Jack. And I've seen what happens when young families can't move into a town, can't farm the land around it. Um, we eventually, the, 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 the store went out, the town has been under enormous stress, has shrunk. We have to make investments in our people. And I'm so glad to hear you pick up on student loans. This is one of the most serious problems facing America today. We're crushing an entire generation of young people with student loan debt. The student loan debt burden in America is now one and a half trillion dollars. And the interest rate, the fees running on it, the number who are in default, means that that student loan debt burden is growing at a rate of a hundred billion dollars a year. It is affecting virtually every choice that young people make, including the choice to have to go to big cities where wages are higher, because they don't give you a discount on your student loan if you're out there trying to start a business, if you're out there trying to start a farm. So the very first bill when I got to the United States Senate was on this subject. Um, this one's very personal for me. My daddy ended up as a janitor. My big chance to become a public school teacher was to go to a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. That's how it is. You don't have to incur those loans to begin with. Those opportunities are not out there for young people today. We need to make the investment in our young people. My first bill was to refinance student loan and bring down the debt burden. That's what we've got to do across this country, and I commit to you that that's what I will do. By the way, I should say one more thing about that. It was six years ago, I was a baby senator, never been around the block on this. It was my first bill. And do you know how many co-sponsors I got on that bill? Because no one was talking about the student loan debt burden. It was something that people were carrying one at a time. It's like rocks on their back. Nobody talked about it. When I introduced that bill, we put out a petition, and this is before they were doing a whole lot of the online petitions, and we had 100,000 people by the end of the week saying, I'm in this fight. I ultimately got a vote on it. We got it through the, we got a majority in the Senate to refinance student loan debt. Couldn't get it on over, couldn't get it passed with a high enough majority. Only in the Senate does this happen because of the filibuster. Uh, and couldn't get it over to the House. But this is one of those reminders of how important outside pressure is. Because this issue, which is so critical to our country and our country's future, has moved from nobody paying any attention, has finally begun to move up the ladder. And that's not relief yet, but I guarantee by 2021, we get the right people back in our government, we will cut this student loan debt burden. So thank you, it's a good question, Carly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Senator, thank you for oh, your time. Thank you very much, Art. Okay. It's good to be here. Elizabeth thank Warren, everybody. And our next guest uh, coming to the stage is a uh, former uh, Housing and Urban Development Secretary from San Antonio, Texas, former mayor, Julian Castro. Hi. Mr. Secretary, thank you. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I think this is maybe the fourth time you've been to Storm Something Lake. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Last time we saw you was in an ice storm in those slick San Antonio <laughs> shoes. <laughs> the first time I was here, I forgot my jacket completely. I was being a total Texan. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've gotten a little bit better. You can borrow my long johns next there time. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I think Amanda wants to ask you a question. All right. <laughs> no, no, first you can think of your remark. <laughs> first remark. Oh, first, um, first we wanted to let you give a couple, have a couple I'm minutes sorry. to give some remarks, if you want, about your candidacy yes, I'm and sorry. sort of why you're running. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much, Art, to Amanda and to Zach, uh, and also a shout out to uh, my former colleague in the Obama administration, Governor Vilsack, uh, who just did a fantastic job for President Obama and I know for Iowa when he was governor. Um, I know the question is about, is about our vision uh, for the country and for rural America. This is what I want for our country in the 21st century. Uh, that we are the smartest, the healthiest, the fairest, and the most prosperous nation on earth. And when I was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, I had the chance to visit a hundred different communities, big and small, in 39 states, uh, including the biggest cities in the United States and some small towns. And what I found was that the basic needs of Americans are largely the same everywhere but they're different in different places in terms of the emphasis. So what I want to make sure is that we connect the dots of all of those things, so for rural America, um, that we invest again in our public schools so that folks can get... <laughs> so we pay teachers what they deserve, we reduce class sizes, we make sure that no matter what the needs of a student are, they can have those needs met where they go to school. Um, in healthcare, that we fund community hospitals, because here in Iowa, many community hospitals are under threat, and a lot of them don't offer things like psychiatric care. Right? You all see the impact of that. Uh, I also believe that we need to make sure that, uh, that no matter where you live in this country, there are good job opportunities, and that in our tax code uh, and the investments that we make, that family farms can thrive, and that you can have clean air and clean water no matter where you live, including in rural America. Um, so I look forward to a conversation about, about these and other issues. Great. So before we came here, we talked to a lot of members of the Storm Lake community about what they wanted to hear from the candidates. And a lot of people actually said gun policy. And I feel like right now, a lot of the discussion around guns focuses on background checks and assault weapons. Uh, but there's a lot more going on out there. Uh, suicides are on the rise, particularly suicides in rural areas that involve guns. And this affects older white men because they tend to own more guns. So I was wondering, uh, do you think that the discussion around gun policy needs to focus more on access issues? And does it need to go bigger and talk about more than just background checks? Well, I think it does. And my hope is that in the conversations that folks are having, whether it's here or you know when I visit some of the big cities, the, what the conversations they're having there uh, also will, will add to the, to the debate. Um, let me just start off by saying that I support uh, common sense gun reform, universal background checks, limiting the capacity of, of magazines, um, reinstituting an updated assault weapons ban. I also believe that one of the under-talked about things is the number of suicides that people commit using a firearm. Uh, and that we need to do several things. Number one, we need to make sure that folks who uh, have access to a gun or who can get access to a gun, that, that they are responsible individuals. That's why we need universal background checks. But also, it goes to something deeper, and it's the stigma that is still attached to people that uh, have issues related to mental health. This ties back, as I said, to one of the challenges here in rural America, which is that seven or eight rural hospitals over the last several years have done away with their inpatient psychiatric care. And recently, the legislature has tried to take steps to improve that, but I don't think that they've funded it the way they should, right? Um, so all of these issues are related. We absolutely need a better conversation about how to prevent suicide by gun, but we also need to work on the stigma and the care that people can receive as they have suicidal thoughts. 
and that goes to our healthcare policy and the investments that we make as well. All of these things are connected. So the studies show that when people have more access to guns, like if guns are lying around, they're more likely to commit suicide simply because the guns are there. I mean, do you think that, do you think that access is an issue or that's not the direction that this debate should go in? Well, I do think that access is an issue in terms of who's able to get their hands on a gun, okay. sure. Um, if what you mean is, are we going to go to an America where people cannot get guns at all, then, you know, no, we're not. Um, but sure, I mean, I think that's the purpose of background checks. That's also the purpose of uh, encouraging responsibility for parents, for instance, around children or minors. Uh, I know that in rural America, it's common for uh, young people get, to get taught how to use a gun at a young age. And, uh, you know, a lot of them are able to responsibly grow up understanding uh, the seriousness of firearms. Um, that's not always the, always the case, though. And so, of course, there are access issues. And I think that we need to address that largely through background checks. Uh, I support that. So continuing a similar, similar vein here, in the final year of the Obama administration, uh, for the first time since World War I, life expectancy in the United States actually declined. This is a unique calamity among wealthy, technologically sophisticated nations. It doesn't happen elsewhere in the world. We know the Obama administration got a lot of things right, but as someone who served in the administration, what went wrong? You're saying what went wrong because the life expectancy of the country uh, went sure. down and, and in the last year of the administration? Right, and driven by deaths that we typically associate with despair. I mean, opioid overdoses, suicides, alcohol-related fatalities. Yeah, well, number one, I mean, I would reject the premise of the question that somehow the Obama administration alone was responsible for that trend. Um, <laughs> what I would say, though, what I would say is that that underscores how important it is that we, that we go to a system where everybody has access to Medicare, for instance, where we strengthen Medicare and make sure that everybody has it. Um, it, it, it goes to the issue of things like paid sick leave and family leave so that people have the time necessary to care for somebody else or to care for themselves when they need it. It goes to things like raising the minimum wage. We haven't raised the minimum wage in 10 years. We need to raise the minimum wage. Um, and all of those things that go into life expectancy. And so I wouldn't peg that on any one administration. I would say that it highlights the need for us to make investments in people, in the well-being of our American community if we want to go in a positive direction in the years to come. So just to follow up, beginning in 2013, there's a Washington Post report a couple weeks ago saying that the administration was getting reports of elevated opioid deaths. Here in Iowa, the issue is more about meth rather than opioids. What would you do as president to deal with opioid and meth? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, whether it's in my neck of the woods in Texas or here in Iowa or other places, that is a, a serious challenge. Um, I would make sure that states and local governments have the resources that they need um, to offer treatment to people who uh, have an addiction. Uh, I would also ensure that we get more serious about investing in our ports of entry. About a month or five weeks ago, you all may have seen that we had the largest fentanyl bust in our nation's history uh, in Arizona. And that fentanyl was not coming through the desert. It was coming through at one of the ports of entry where trucks and cars come through at 254 pounds. We can make sure that, that we invest in technology and personnel to better secure our ports of entry so that we catch not only human trafficking better, but also drug trafficking. Mr. Secretary, immigrants revitalize rural communities like Storm Lake, where 90% of our schools are uh, children of color. Uh, Two-thirds of Iowa's 99 counties, all rural, are declining in population and commerce, while urban areas consolidate the state's wealth. How can we ease the transition of immigrants into rural areas to rejuvenate them? Yeah. Well, let me say, Art, and you know, that I know that that's a very meaningful question coming from you and your work. Um, I'm very proud of the story of Storm Lake in many ways. Uh, Y'all have shown a lot of other communities how it can be done. Right. Um, I'm the grandson. I grew up with my mother and my grandmother. And my grandmother had come over from Mexico when she was seven years old with her little sister because their parents had died. And she worked as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter her whole life. 
right, and raised my mom as a single parent. And I know throughout the generations, wherever people have come from, whether it was from Ireland or from Germany or Mexico, wherever, immigrants work hard. And y'all have seen here in Storm Lake the value of the immigrant community in opening up uh, little restaurants, other little stores. I never thought before this campaign that I would get great Mexican food in Iowa, but I have. <laughs> I have. And, um, so um, let me just say that in the next few days, I'm going to release a, an immigration plan that I think is going to be bold uh, and will set us on a better course than, than this president with a dark vision of immigration. We don't have to choose between having a secure border Every country in the world, of course, wants to have a secure, secure border and should. We can have a secure border and also be compassionate and recognize the value of our immigrant community that are already doing great things. So, um, so, but just very quickly in general, you know, I, I believe that on January 20th, 2021 at 12.01 p.m., we're going to have a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House. And, uh, and when it comes to immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform, the lesson of 2009, 2010 was don't wait. And right. I won't wait. Um, you know, we will create a path to citizenship for the 10 to 11 undocumented immigrants who are here as long as they have been law abiding. Um, we will take the target off the back of people who have TPS or temporary protective status. Uh, we will ensure that dreamers, we can harness their talent and their ability uh, to move our nation forward in the 21st century global economy. Um, and also, we will make smart investments like the one that I mentioned about ports of entry so that we can better detect and combat drug trafficking and sex trafficking in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Now one of my favorite questions of the day is coming from the audience. Emily Cole is the treasurer of the Iowa Farmers Union and is a program coordinator for Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Local Foods Program. She was raised on a corn and soybean farm that went near uh, Panora that went bankrupt in the 1980s farm crisis and currently lives in Boone. Thanks, Art. Thank you for being here. Uh, current farm policy promotes a corporate agriculture that is advancing climate change while polluting our water and air and killing off our small towns. What federal policies would you uh, promote to support more nature-friendly, family-scale food farming in the Midwest so we can become more economically, socially, and environmentally resilient? Yeah, thank you very much for that. Well, you know, our, our family farms help feed America and the world, really, and, uh, and so we need to make sure that uh, that they can succeed, uh, and also that people in these rural areas and rural communities can have clean air and clean water. Number one, uh, I would appoint people to the EPA who actually believe in environmental protection. You know, they've reduced the budget of the EPA, uh, you know, I think it's something like 30% when it comes to trying to enforce some of these laws. I would ensure that uh, we request from Congress the funding that is necessary to enforce the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, and that that applies everywhere. Um, I also believe, like others, and I think Senator Warren has been fantastic on this, and I know she talked about it, um, but you know, that, that when we analyze uh, antitrust, um, that we not only concern ourselves with the, with the end consumer price and choice, but also what's happening along the production chain and the impact on smaller businesses within that production, production chain. Uh, I want to make sure that we have folks in the Department of Justice and other departments that understand that philosophy. Um, in addition to that, I think that you know, the, the Department of Agriculture and the Small Business Administration have a tremendous role to play in helping to ensure that small businesses, uh, including uh, family farms, are well capitalized and pursuing policy that helps them get there. Right. Well, thank you, Secretary Castro. Right. Thank you all very much. Julian Castro. Thank you. Buenos dias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, okay, and now uh, our next guest uh, is a former representative from Maryland, John Delaney. I think we. I don't think we have John Delaney yet. I don't think John Delaney's here just yet. Let's try so. a different. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really anxious to talk to Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> Senator from Minnesota. She's not here yet. Hey, Art. Ten more minutes. So okay. we have to sp kill a little bit of time because we don't oh. have the candidates right yet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the cue that we're getting. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Uh -huh. Once, uh, once uh, Congressman Delaney gets here, though, we'll pick up with that. So, Art, do you have any thoughts on how the 2020 election's going? <laughs> um, well, um, <laughs> we thought we were gonna we thought we were gonna run out of time. We didn't think we'd have this extra time. Yes. Uh, okay. Well. Uh, anyway, uh, we're uh, uh, the 2020 election. Uh, well, it's pretty unusual, first of all, that we were able to get five candidates. At least I think we have five candidates here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they are reaching out to rural Iowa. I mean, why do you think so many are coming this time? I mean, Hillary didn't come in 2016 and Trump didn't come. So why do you think, you know, already at least three candidates have come? Because I think that they realize that this election is going to be decided in the Midwest, I believe, from, uh, from Iowa <laughs> to Ohio. And... Uh, uh, and of course, it all starts in Iowa, uh, where the caucuses are. And I think uh, uh, these candidates realize that uh, that uh, we're not flyover country, and that to win America, you need to win Wisconsin. And uh, and to do that, you need to address the immediate crisis in the dairy industry. I have good news. Well, folks should also buy Art's book about Storm Lake, which is a really great book. If I mean, most of you have probably read it, but if, in case you haven't, you should buy it. But also, we have Congressman Delaney now. So oh, excellent, <laughs> we excellent. Up. <laughs> oh, it's great to see you, great to see you. This is Congressman uh, John Delaney from Maryland, former congressman. <laughs> Well, oh, thanks for being here. Well, I couldn't be happier. Thanks yeah, for the, having me. The subways are tough this time of day. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was worried about getting blown off the road. <laughs> yeah, fun. exactly. Well, it, it's great to have you here again. And, great to be uh, back. You have a special place in my heart. As this big. is bigger than the Storm Lake Times. It is, actually. It is. Uh, he also came in a blizzard, and uh, I had a special place in my heart for him because he was the first candidate to buy an ad from us. <laughs> <laughs> so... That, that's that private sector experience that that's I That's right, that's right. So why don't you just take a couple minutes and uh, tell us uh, uh, about your campaign and uh, your vision for rural America, please. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me. It's great to be here with you. I really admire the fact that you're doing this. Art, thank you for all you do to make sure the voice of rural America is heard all around this country. It's thank really you. important work. <laughs> and I see another great... Journalist from rural America in the front row there, Mr. Leonard, thank you, Bob, for what you do as well. That's very nice. And I know you had the governor was here, the secretary, uh, Tom Vilsack, who was just an extraordinary representative uh, for our country when he was serving as, a, a, as the uh, agriculture secretary. We did a lot of work together, and, and I'm grateful that he was here. And I know JD's around here because I, uh, I see the Sioux City Sioux out there. You normally, can see, you normally can see J.D. if everyone's standing. <laughs> Where is he? All right, J.D. Thank you. You know, the earned income tax credit is uh, one of the most important things, and it should be a centerpiece of our tax policy in this country, and J.D.'s doing great work. So, uh, Art, my campaign is about bringing this country together, because I think the central question facing this country is how terribly divided we are, getting real things done to matter to the American people, and kind of rethinking our future, because I think we all deserve a better future. I just announced my Heartland Fair Deal, which is a comprehensive set of proposals to actually start partnering, partnering with rural America 
so that we're creating jobs, reversing some of the trends, and really improving the conditions in rural America. It has a health care component to it, right, because I think we all know what's going on with health care in rural America, and particularly for our veterans, which is a big issue. It has an infrastructure proposal to it. It's a trillion dollar infrastructure program nationally with a disproportionate allocation to rural America, broadband, you know, climate resilient infrastructure. It deals with ag policy, and I know we'll talk about that, do, doing some things to actually create an antitrust framework that makes sense for our country. But it also really focuses on investments. Because I've always believed that unless you invest in people and unless you invest in communities, nothing really happens. And people invested in me. I mean, I grew up in a blue collar family. Neither of my parents went to college. My dad was an electrician. But my dad's union, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, helped me go to college through a scholarship, right? <laughs> and but for that union, I would have never been able to go to Columbia University, something that changed my life. Never been able to go to Georgetown Law School, where the best thing that ever happened to me happened, which is I met my wife. I've been happily married for 29 years with four daughters. And she is the daughter of an Idaho potato farmer. So the union electrician's son from New Jersey meets the Idaho potato farmer's daughter at Georgetown, only in America. <laughs> but I actually watched him lose his family farm in the farming crisis in the 80s. Right. So that was really an introduction to me of the struggle. So a big centerpiece of my heartland fair deal is to actually do things to make sure capital is flowing to rural America, because that's really what's happened to rural America in the last several decades, in my judgment. Capital has left this region. That doesn't mean people don't invest here, they do. But the owners of that capital are often not located here anymore like they used to be. So the returns on those investments don't get invested in these communities, in good wages and other things these communities need. And as someone who was an entrepreneur and spent my whole career in the private sector creating businesses, but I started two businesses, they became public companies, I created thousands of jobs. What my businesses did was lend money to small to mid-sized companies all over this country, and a lot of them in rural America. 5,000 companies. So I believe in the power of investment. People invested in me, and it made a difference. And I spent my career investing in other people, Great. and I know it made a difference. So that's the cornerstone of my Heartland Fair Deal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Zach. So you've been talking about bipartisanship a lot here yes. in Iowa. In Washington, that's sometimes a code word for policies that help corporations that invest heavily in both political parties. Over the course of your congressional career, you've accepted over $2 million from the financial sector, and you also spent a lot of time working with Republicans to roll back aspects of the 2010 Dodd-Frank financial reform law. Do you think that's an important model for the next president? Well, look, at I focused, the things I did in the Dodd-Frank framework were focused on helping community banks because I think community banks are the backbone of our country. I mean, they are. Listen, the premise of my businesses was focusing on lending money to small to mid-sized companies. And I was good at it, and we were very successful. And one of the reasons we were successful is because the big banks ignore those companies. They ignore those companies. And our community banks, which are shrinking rapidly in number, really deserve some regulatory relief, not big banks, but community banks really do deserve regulatory relief so they have the flexibility to make the kind of loans in local communities that businesses need. Because if you cut off community banks or you put so many burdensome regulations on them so they can't function and they have to be sold to big banks, that's not going to help Main Street America and that's not going to help rural America. So just to clarify, though. It's true. What does that have to do with uh, credit default swaps, which you voted to deregulate? Overwhelmingly, that market is for the five largest banks, six largest banks in the country. Well, first of all, I didn't, I didn't vote to deregulate credit default swaps, right? That's a completely, no disrespect, but inaccurate statement. Access to cheaper taxpayer funding. I, I didn't vote to provide access to cheaper taxpayer funding. I voted as to clean up, I was on the Financial Services Committee. From time to time, adjustments to the Dodd-Frank law came before us, and when things made sense, I voted for it. I happen to believe that if we do something really big in this country, like we did with the Affordable Care Act, which reformed one-sixth of the U.S. economy, or we did with Dodd-Frank, which was absolutely necessary, 
I mean, 19 of the 20 largest financial institutions in this country failed in the financial crisis or took money from the government, 19 of 20. So of course we had to do something really big. But I also believe it's a fundamental responsibility of the Congress and the government to update those transformative laws because you shouldn't presume you got it right the first time. And so a lot of the stuff I did in terms of regulatory relief was really focused on small institutions. Mr. Delaney. Um, Mr. Cullen. Mr. Delaney. <laughs> Mr. Delaney. It's, it's formal on this side. Yes, right. <laughs> hey, John. That's better. That's better, Art. Half of Iowa's rural children are born into Medicaid, yet we continue to limit medical access through the program. Some 15 rural nursing homes have been closed in Iowa in uh, 2017 because of strictures on Medicaid, forcing the elderly away from their families in this, the most elderly state. Rural hospitals are going broke under late reimbursement or taking a loss on Medicaid patients. The program has been under attack in legislatures across the Midwest for years. How can we stop this war on the p working poor, children, and elderly? Well, so the first thing that shouldn't have happened here in Iowa is they shouldn't have privatized the Medicaid system. <laughs> Because to some extent, that was a transfer from Medicaid recipients to a managed care company who was hired to run the, the program. Right. And that was a bad decision, and it was a bad outcome, and it hurt citizens of Iowa. The problem with Medicaid here in Iowa is the same problem Medicaid has in most parts of this country, which is they don't reimburse enough. You know, nationwide, Medicaid only pays 80% of costs. So if you actually ran a hospital and all of your patients were Medicaid, you'd lose 20%. Right? That's a fundamental problem with Medicaid, right. which is one of the reasons I've proposed a universal health care system that gives every American health care as a right, you know, as a right of citizenship. Because we, we can afford it. We can absolutely afford it. We're spending more money than anyone else. And it's also smart economic policy. You don't want people tied to their jobs. I mean, I started my business, and the only reason I was able to do it, because we were starting a young family. I had four daughters at the time. But my wife worked at a firm that had health care. Otherwise, I would have been shackled to my job like so many Americans. So everyone should have health care as a right. It should be a mixed model. We have a basic government plan, and then the ability to have private insurance as supplementals or other options. And I'd roll Medicaid into that and have minimum standards for Medicaid that are similar to what's laid out in the Affordable Care Act and do things like we do in Medicare. See, Medicare doesn't pay cost either, which is a little bit of a problem, but they pay 95% of costs. So I would want to get those Medicaid reimbursement rates up as part of rolling Medicaid into a universal health care plan. If you get the rates up, then people invest more in the program. In other words, doctors are more likely to move right. to a community. Someone's likely to build a hospital. Right. I mean, what's going on with rural hospitals in this country, particularly as we age, it's a huge challenge because, you know, you go to your average rural hospital and you ask them how much they get paid from commercial insurance as compared to Medicare for the same procedure. They'd say, well, we get paid about twice from commercial insurance as we do for Medicare. But as this country's aging and more people are going on Medicare, reimbursement rates are going down, and that's really hurting rural hospitals. Thank you. Great You're answer. Welcome. Is it your turn now? It is my turn now. So, Congressman, you've expressed concern about the rising national debt and yes. said that it will require some tough choices. I'm wondering if Social Security will be part of that equation. That's a big concern to places with aging populations like Iowa. And will that require changing the benefit formula, raising the retirement age, or will you be able to do that without uh, making benefits less generous? No, I don't think you should raise the retirement age, actually. Because the problem with raising the retirement age... <clears throat> No, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, raising the retirement age is one of those things everyone kind of thinks makes sense before you actually look at what's going on. The problem in this country is low-income Americans or poor Americans are actually not living longer. Their life expectancy is being reduced because of poverty and other terrible conditions that are going on around our country. So if you actually raise the retirement age, you're effectively creating a system that a lot of low-income Americans will never benefit from. So I wouldn't be in favor of raising the retirement age. I think Social Security is actually a very easy program to get on a better fiscal trajectory. Because, in fact, it's solvent since inception. 
All these people who tell you that Social Security is bankrupt, they're just not looking at the facts. From the beginning of this program, more money has been paid in than has been paid out. The problem is we're entering a phase, because of the aging of the baby boomers, where more money is getting paid out than is being paid in. And it'll go in reverse by about 2030 to 2031. And the problem, if that happens, is by law, we have to cut benefits. And that would be a 25% cut in benefits. And that would be immoral, in my opinion. So what I want to do, and the reason I, I sponsored the only bipartisan proposal to actually strengthen Social Security in the Congress, and I did it with a great Republican named Tom Cole from Oklahoma, is we called for a commission, very similar to the Greenspan Commission, which Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan did, where they put some experts in a room and they said, come back with a proposal to extend the solvency of Social Security for 50 years, but don't hurt, hurt the program. And they did. And, and O'Neill and Reagan agreed that Congress would vote on whatever they came back with, up or down, and the Congress passed it. That was 1980. They extended the solvency to 2030. And the, senior, the poverty rate of seniors, when they did it, was 20 percent, and now it's 10 percent. So it shows you you can make adjustments to Social Security and not hurt the program. And that's what I propose we do. We set up a similar commission. They go off. They come up with a recommendation. And I believe we can extend the solvency of Social Security for 75 years and have very little impact on the program. Because if you make those adjustments now, it's really easy to do. If you wait to the last minute, it's really hard to do. And that's why I've been so focused on taking this incredibly important program, which is arguably the most successful anti-poverty program this country has ever created, and making sure it's around for the next generation of Americans. Thanks. And now we're going to turn to the audience again. Uh, first up is Storm Lake City Councilman Jose Ibarra, who emigrated here from Mexico. Have at it, Jose. Thank you for having me. Hi, Jose. Hi, how you doing? Good. So one of the main issues affecting rural communities is the lack of a workforce. Yes. Uh, it took me 16 years to get my citizenship. It took my wife nearly 20 years to get her green card. Now, with the current administration and even our very own Steve King continuing <laughs> to demonize immigrants from the Latin American countries. Can we not talk about Steve King? <laughs> Good. Sorry. So, uh, so as, as he continues to demonize us, yes. the current immigration laws are very likely to stay the same or perhaps even get worse. If you were president, what would you do or what changes would you recommend to those immigration laws that would make it easier and simpler for people that want to come and work yep. to be able to do it and yep. do it legally? Great. Great question. So, so Jose, uh, if the gentleman could just step so I could see Jose, thank you. So, uh, Jose, in my first 100 days as president, I've pledged to have a list of five or six things that I'm going to focus on in my first three months. And all of those things are big ideas that I know have bipartisan support and I can get them done. On that list is comprehensive immigration reform, very similar to what we had in 2013. That was a huge missed opportunity for this country, right? It passed the Senate with significant bipartisan support. It would have passed the House if it had a vote, and President Obama would have signed it into law. And it, it took the whole immigration system, which hasn't been updated in a long time, and did important updates. It reformed our visa programs. It created a pathway to legal status and citizenship for the 11 million undocumented folks in our country who are contributing to our country in so many ways, in our communities in so many ways. And then it actually put money on border security. So it was, the, it was a perfect deal in many ways, right? Because everyone got something they wanted. And we should put our shoulder right behind that and get it passed. Our country would be much better off today in so many ways if that law had passed. It was a huge missed opportunity. But I also think there's some other things we have to address as part of our immigration strategy. And that is what's going on with asylum seekers at the, Mex the, the Mexican border and what's going on in Central America. My wife and I actually went down there two months ago. We took 14 law students with us. My wife just stepped down as the board chair of Georgetown Law School. And we took two law professors for a week to help asylum seekers make their case for seeking asylum in our country. So I sat with these women and children. It was at a facility in Dilly, Texas, where there are 1,700 women and children, at least there were back two months ago. And when you hear the stories of what these people 
and the conditions that they're fleeing, every single person in this room would do the same thing. And so we have to actually do something there as well if we, if we ever want to kind of stabilize the situation. So I'm for comprehensive immigration reform just like we almost and should have done in 2013, and I'm going to put all the way to the office behind getting that done, hopefully in my first 100 days of office. So thank you, Jose. And our next question comes from uh, the audience, is, uh, from Betsy Lensmeyer, who's uh, uh, of Storm Lake, and she's a mother of a child with special needs and a community volunteer. Thanks, Betsy. Thanks, Mr. Cullen. Hi, Betsy. Hi. The needs of rural schools are rarely addressed in the national conversation around K-12 education policy. What are some ways the federal government can play a role in reducing inequity and improving outcomes for the 20% of America's children who attend rural schools? Right. Great question. You know, one of the great injustices in our society is actually how we fund public education in this country. Because it's, it's true. It, it's racially unjust, and in many ways, it, it's obviously unfair to communities that are struggling economically. And unfortunately, because of what's happened in the last several decades, a lot of that is rural America. And uh, so, so that, that's where the role of the federal government comes in, in my judgment, to support schools, particularly those that are in areas where there aren't a lot of property taxes, right? Because I think every kid in this country should not only have a quality public education, but we shouldn't do things to erode public education and kind of voucherize the whole education system. We should be investing in public schools. I think every kid should start at pre-K as a right. You do a good job with that here in Iowa, but a lot of places in the country don't. And I think everyone should have something after high school as part of a public education. Career or technical training. It's true. Career or technical training or community college. You know, last year the U.S. military said that 71% of high school graduates were not eligible for the military because of academic, health care, or social deficiencies. So that's a bit of a report card on, on how well we're doing with some of our public schools. And I also think there needs to be much more zero to three programming, for, particularly for low-income kids. Because too often you hear these stories where kids start school and they've heard a third of the words other kids have because they grow up in a low-income family. So we have to be supporting our public schools if we want to have a civilized, progressive, advancing society. Right? Because public education is really about the future. And this issue with how they're funded is really a problem. Because, you know, last year in our country, 80% of the venture capital, you know, the kind of money that invests in, like, the next great company, 80% of that money went to 50 counties in our country out of 3,100 counties. So 1.6% of our counties got 80% of the smart money, yet 80% of our kids live in a county where the jobs that are getting created are not as good as the jobs that used to exist. Which is, I mean, it's terrible. That's not, a, that's not a country of opportunity, that's a country of birthright. Right? Where you gotta be born. And that's why so much of my agenda is focused on policies to encourage people to invest in communities. Because when I'm done being president, I want 80% of the venture capital to not go in 50 counties, but to go in 1,500. I want there to be a resurgence of investment in these kind of communities. And I know how to do it. I spent my whole life doing it. Right? There are real policies that can get people to invest in communities. And so while the federal government is doing things to help public schools, I want to help these economies so that the tax base grows, right? And then that can also fuel better public education. There's a, so thank you, Betsy. There's another part of this, too, that uh, about a third of Iowa is a, is a child care desert. <laughs> Uh, you can't get, there is no daycare facility, right. a center in Storm Lake, a town of 10 right. to 15,000 people. What can we do about it? So that's why this zero to three is so important, right? Because I think of education as the, the kind of the pathway, right? And, and we think of the pathway right now as K through 12. That was actually developed in 1892 by 10 progressives who were thinking about the next century and the education kids would need. We literally haven't updated that. And I think it should be pre-K through something after high school, and we absolutely need zero to three programs. Right? Absolutely. You know, and they, sh and, and they have to be kind of means-tested, because, you, you know, at this point, I want to make pre-K 
a, a right of every kid and things after, after high school, but zero to three programs so that every kid in this country has access to early childhood education. It is absolutely the best investment we make. The, the trajectory of those kids changes entirely across their whole educational experience and across their lifetime earnings. The return on that investment is absolutely the best investment we make. And no kid in Storm Lake or anywhere else should not have access to early childhood education. Thank you. <laughs> Big hand for Representative John Delaney. Thank you. Thank you, Art. I love seeing you. I love seeing you, too. Hey, thank so you. Nice so nice to much. meet you. Thank you. Nice. Howard Feynman said the same thing. He's going to be my in-law. <laughs> Exit stage left. <laughs> Great. And uh, now, uh, our neighbor from the north, Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. <laughs> Senator, thanks for coming. It's great Thank to see you. Thank you so much. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Dad. Good to see you again. Please have a seat. Thank you, Art. Well, the first, the most important question on the minds of most people here today is if you think the twins have enough pitching to get them through <laughs> April. Well, let's just say they're playing now, but after one game, they are 1-0. and oh. That's right. <laughs> they beat <laughs> Cleveland in the opener. Excellent. It was great. We're going to win the Central. I believe it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> take a couple minutes and just tell us, tell us uh, Iowans of lesser standing, of course, than Minnesotans, uh, why you're running for president <laughs> and what your campaign's all about. Well, first of all, it is wonderful to be here. And as you know, I'm your senator next door. I can see Iowa from my porch. <laughs> and I, um... Right. After spending, after spending the morning today on Hornick and yesterday right outside of Council Bluffs in these flooded areas and seeing homeowners and farmers who'd lost everything, and yet they were still there at the pancake breakfast today helping each other. It made me think about what we have right now going on in the White House. That is not the community spirit that brings us together. What we see is someone that divides us, and I want to emulate that community spirit we see right here in Iowa, and that is crossing the river of our divides to a higher plane in our politics. That's why I'm running. Number two. Coming from a state that is major in agriculture, I believe that kids that grow up in rural America should be able to live in rural America. And that means a strong safety net in a farm bill. That's why since 2008, I've been advocating for commodity caps. I figured these payments should go to small farmers and not to the 90210 area code. Uh, that is why... I've advocated for new ideas like a vaccine bank and making sure that our beginning farmers and ranchers have the incentives so we have young people going into agriculture. Something that I know Tom Vilsack has been such a leader on. Thank you, Tom. And that is also why I believe we need good education, rural hospitals that are strong, broadband to every house. And the last thing I'd bring up as ranking member of the Antitrust Committee, uh, is an issue that I have seen all over this country, but particular with agriculture. When we're in a situation where 78% of the seed for our farmers is controlled by two companies, and our railroads now for class one are down to four, the same number as on the monopoly board, um, I think we are now entering what is essentially a new gilded age, and we need to take on the power of these monopolies. Thank you. Uh, the greatest threat to Iowa is not Mexicans hopping off a freight train if they don't die trying. The greatest threat is soil loss wrought by extreme weather as a result of climate change. Iowa is losing soil four to ten times faster than it can be regenerated. University of Minnesota research suggests that corn yields in Iowa could decline by 50 percent in coming decades. What are you prepared to do now about climate change and to stop this calamitous soil loss to protect food production in North America? Very good question. I think our farmers are good stewards, right? But what we have seen in this country is a change in our climate. What we have seen is a warming of our climate, 
uh, to the point uh, that we know that it's going on right now. We see it in those floods I just talked about. We see it in the wildfires. And I actually think it's important to have a candidate from the Midwest who's able to talk about these Midwestern issues as well as what's going on in the coast with climate change. So what I think that we need to do is, number one, on day one, as your president, I will sign us back into that international climate change agreement. We are the only country that's not in it. Number two, bringing back the clean power rules uh, that have been worked on for years and are now in the cutting room floor in the Trump administration, as well as gas mileage standards, as well as some smarter ideas for transit and infrastructure and building codes. But the one thing I would add is to keep the conservation provisions in that farm bill strong. I think you all know. and. Senator, Senator Thune and I led the sod saver provision in this last farm bill. And actually the farm bill is one of the best conservation measures that we've got. And what we've learned over time is that we're gonna get that thing passed given that we lose conservative Republicans even from rural states all the time. We need to have a coalition of people who care about nutrition, people who care about farming, and people who care about conservation, including our hunters. And that has made a big difference in getting that farm bill passed, and we need to keep those conservation provisions strong. Thank you. You're welcome. Senator, uh, local media is struggling. I know Art has plenty of stories, and I know you come from a news family. Uh, a lot of things have been blamed, private equity, corporate ownership, uh, social media companies like Facebook. What do you think the cause is, and what role do you think the federal government has, if any, in helping local media? Very good question. And by the way, I guess everyone should just win a Pulitzer Prize like <laughs> ours, and you know, we'd be fine. Um, I believe that you've seen a situation where the social media companies keep saying, you know, we're really just the internet, we're not media companies. <laughs> They are media companies. Uh, they are making a profit off of our personal data. And so we have to treat them like media companies. That doesn't mean that we want them to go away. It doesn't mean we don't want to communicate versus the internet and go backwards in time. It just means that we need to put rules of the road in place. First of all, privacy legislation. Um, I don't think that your data should be sent out without your permission to everyone in the world. You have a right to keep that private. Um, secondly, making sure uh, that we're notified of breaches. This is all in a bill that I have with Senator Kennedy of Louisiana. Third thing, antitrust that I already mentioned. Um, looking at the antitrust rules in another way to look at monopsonies and look at what the acquisitions are and looking not just at the mergers when they occur going forward, but also backwards. And the last thing I'd mention, which really matters for our democracy, especially for people in Iowa that wanna have a voice in our democracy, um, and that is what went on in 2016 when people bought one, not people, corporations, Russia, about $1.4 billion in ads on the internet. And there was not one rule in place that allowed you to find out where that money came from and how it was spent and what those ads were. And that's why the Honest Ads Act that I introduced with Senator McCain um, last session and that I'm gonna introduce again once I find a Republican, maybe you can find one for me, um, <laughs> we need to pass it. Uh, because it is the only way we can guarantee uh, that we know exactly the money being spent looking at $4 billion going into this next election. $4 billion in ads. We want to know what those ads are and who's paying for them. Otherwise, all of these campaign finance rules that we have in place mean nothing. So in a normal year, American farmers <laughs> ship, <laughs> normal. Uh, ship about 30 million tons of soybeans to China. It's about a fourth of the entire domestic harvest for soybeans. The Chinese government currently has hundreds of thousands of Uyghur Muslims detained in re-education camps. What are America's moral and economic obligations when our trading partners engage in widespread human rights violations? That has to be. Thank you. That has to be, you're clapping for him. Not me. Um, that has to be a major part of our trade negotiations, but it also has to be um, what you want to see in a president and how a president addresses human rights 
violations. I mean, you've got a president that stands up and says he believes Vladimir Putin stands next to him and says that over his own intelligence or is willing to turn the other way uh, when an, a journalist for an American newspaper gets killed and dismembered uh, in an in a embassy in Saudi Arabia and doesn't hold them responsible. That is turning the other cheek when it comes to human rights. Uh, but this president needs to go back to the negotiating table with China. There's a lot of other issues, as you know, as well. Human rights has got to be a major part of the discussion. Um, and the other thing that I'd add here is when you talk about what our farmers have been through, uh, especially when it comes to soybeans, I mean, we've had a situation of the weather being bad. Uh, we've had some of the lowest profits for agriculture, uh, at least in my state, since the 1980s. And I know that Iowa is experiencing this too. And while I'm glad that the administration uh, decided to uh, get that $12 billion set aside to make up uh, for these trade wars, that's not the same as actually selling things, right? That's not the same of having value uh, with your product. Um, and one other thing I know that Art has been focused on this is we, have a, we had a soybean farmer up in northern Minnesota, and I've gotten to know his wife really well. And last year they couldn't make it, two years ago, 2017. They tried. Uh, they couldn't get the financing, a farm that had been in their family since 1899, 950 acres. And last year he committed suicide. And that's what we're starting to see because people, it's not just earning a living, right? It's your whole life. This is a family that was passed on from generation to generation to generation. And that's why I feel so strongly that this rural agenda has to include understanding the people that make our agricultural system run, the people that food doesn't just magically show up on your table, that you don't just get something on your plate out of the blue. And so that's why suicide prevention, uh, making sure that we have money set aside uh, for mental health, right? Uh, for rural areas and that we are focusing on rural areas. And then one other bill that I just reintroduced last week when it comes to farm bankruptcies, um, putting provisions in there that allow you to keep your farm when you're in bankruptcy. Now we're gonna uh, take a question from the audience from our gracious host today, Buena Vista University President, Dr. Joshua Merchant. First, let me welcome you to uh, BVU. We're in a climate where everybody seems to be talking about free college. And I'm interested how uh, you would propose to pay for that. But secondly, I'm interested in how you would think about protecting rural private institutions of higher education that serve students who are looking for an outstanding educational experience, as well as preserving those institutions like Buena Vista University, exactly. who support and strengthen our community here in Storm Lake, our region, and our state. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, you're actually talking to the person you should watch my CNN debate that was asked about free college for everyone by a student, and I said, I don't think we can afford free college for everyone. So that's me. Now you can clap by yourself, but yes. <laughs> um, so I, um, what I do think that we can do is expand Pell Grants uh, in a big way to make them more accessible, uh, to make it so that kids can refinance their student loans, and actually adults can, um, because right now we have a situation where uh, we could easily pay for this by just putting the Buffett rule in place, um, and by looking at the way our tax code works, um, and I also think that we should have free two-year community college. Uh, when I look at the jobs that are available right now out there, we have a lot of job openings for in areas that could use a one-year degree, a two-year degree, um, and we're just not filling those jobs. And part of this would be an economic imperative, but the other part of it um, is that there are a lot of kids that just go off the grid and a lot of kids that could work in rural jobs. And if we can get them started uh, in that way, and then they can later get another degree, they can later go on to complete their four-year degree. That's what my own sister did. She didn't graduate from high school. She came down to Iowa, thank you, huh. worked in manufacturing for years, then got her two-year degree, then finished her four-year degree, and is now gainfully employed as an accountant. Um, there are many paths to success in the United States of America, and we have to especially understand uh, that we want to recruit teachers uh, for rural areas, and we want to make it easier for rural areas 
that are more isolated to be able to access these programs, whether they're in colleges like this one um, or whether they are in community colleges. So that's going to be my focus. I think we've got to work it with the economy and where the jobs are, um, as well as making college more affordable for everyone, especially rural students. Is your sister still in Iowa? No. No. But it literally, Iowa literally saved her life. And she was able to get a job and she was able to go to a two-year community college just like my dad did. Um, and then she went on just like my dad did at the University of Minnesota, he did, and she did down here. Um, they got their four-year degree. So I just see this idea that you have cookie cutter ways of educating people. It's just not reality for a lot of families. Thank you. Our next question comes from my uh, friend Bob Leonard. He's a uh, news director for KINA, KRLS Radio in Knoxville, Pella, Indianola, and is a frequent contributor to the op-ed pages in the New York Times. Bob? Thank you. Okay, I thought, I thought you were gonna say the Storm Lake time. <laughs> that anyway, too. So, okay, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Senator, in Agri-News last week, Alan Gebert wrote a piece titled Walmart and Costco have become farmers. I'm gonna quote Alan now. In mid-2018, Walmart began bottling milk in a newly built facility near Fort Wayne, Indiana for its, four, for its 500 stores in Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, <coughs> Kentucky, and Indiana. With this, Walmart has Walmart contracted truckers hauling Walmart contracted milk to a Walmart bottling plant that Walmart will then process and haul to Walmart stores on Walmart trucks to sell directly to Walmart customers. Costco's doing the same for chickens and milk and, chick and, milk and chickens are loss leaders for these chains. This vertical integration is a crisis in the industry. What specifically will you do to address it? Thank, Thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. So many, many years ago, there was a movement that started right here in Iowa and it was called, and Minnesota, and it was called the Granger Movement, right? And that's because farmers felt that they weren't getting the right price for their goods because you had um, monopoly railroad companies and you had um, monopolists in iron ore, you had monopolists all over this country. And literally this movement started where farmers were there with their pitchforks um, in barns and meeting with their elected officials and then you had union workers in Chicago and all of this came together to say we want to see a change in our laws. And that's what we need to see today. And I give you two ideas when it comes to this kind of vertical integration. Um, and it's not just, of course, in ag. You're also seeing it in the tech industry and other places. First of all, we need to be able to really jumpstart these investigations because one, the only way you're gonna really get at this is by passing some new rules for how we pay for things. And that's the FTC and the Justice Department. So I suggest you look at my bill that allows fees on these mega mergers and increase in fees. I got a bunch of people on it. I think I'm gonna get a Republican now. Um, and that would better fund these investigations so we start going after these and look at this vertical integration. Um, and you can also do it on the ag side. The second thing is changing our antitrust laws because with Gorsuch and with um, Kavanaugh on the bench, you're not gonna be able to look at these kinds of situations um, through the courts. It's just not gonna happen for decades to come that they're gonna switch on us because they're getting more and more conservative. So again, I'd suggest you look at my bill that changes so that on some of these, this is on merger front, but on some of these major mergers that you actually flip the burden and you say, you know what, if you're gonna have something like this happen, you're gonna have to actually prove that it doesn't reduce competition. Because if we stifle competition through vertical in integration or through monopolies like what we're seeing, we're not just gonna bring up the prices for consumers, we're gonna stifle entrepreneurship, which is exactly why the Grange movement started. And I'll leave you with this. Do you know the first state that had a comprehensive antitrust law? It was Iowa. Iowa did it in, Iowa did it in 1888. That's right. And now we know we have to do it on the federal level and improve some of the laws that we have now. So thank you. Because you're such an efficient answer. I get another question. <laughs> well, 
We have time for one more question, and that's from my good lifelong friend from Storm Lake, Jesse Case. Jesse is a secretary treasurer and principal officer of the Teamsters Local 238 out of Cedar Rapids, the largest local union in the state of Iowa, representing members in both the public and private sectors in 86 of Iowa's 99 counties. Jesse, welcome home, man. The federal government has a history of partnering with big banks and big businesses while leaving working families to fend for themselves. Iowa has the 12th highest percentage of retirees of any state in the nation, and as Iowans grow older, retirement income becomes more and more important to the rural economy. The failure of just one large pension plan, the Teamsters Central States Pension Plan, would mean that Iowa loses $6 million in revenue tax revenue every year and would leave families economically devastated as well as communities. Now, that, and it doesn't just cover Iowa, there are hundreds of thousands of people in this plan uh, in rural states across the Midwest. As president, what would you do uh, to advance legislation to protect pensions and, uh, and solve the pension crisis for multi-employer multi pension plans? In other words, if banks are too big to fail, why aren't middle-class pensions? Okay. Thank you. So I think you know we have been working, and I've been uh, involved in this pretty heavily because we have a lot of central states pensions. As I always say to my colleagues, what do you think the name of it is? Central states pension. Uh, so we have a lot of people from the Midwest in this pension fund. And Sherrod Brown has been leading a group uh, to try to come up with a solution. The original solution, I voted against that budget agreement, if you remember, uh, was just a disaster. It would have literally met people that had worked their entire lives. Many of them truckers would have lost 70%. 50 to 70 percent of their pension. Um, that's why I voted against that budget deal and ultimately um, when they tried implementing it they realized that it wasn't fair. Um, and so the original solution went out the window which was good and now we're trying to come up with another one. And I think you know there's a lot of pay fors out there because this administration, the Trump administration, has time and time again sided with the wealthy instead of working people. Uh, you look at that tax bill. Every point that they went down on the corporate tax rate was where they went all the way down to 21% was $100 billion. $100 billion. Think of that. The way they did the overseas tax havens um, for the money, uh, if you, I don't think many of you have money in the Bahamas, but you were benefited by this. The way they did it, they took the average of all the countries instead of individual countries. You know how much we can save by changing that? $150 billion. Do you know how much comprehensive immigration reform, if they wouldn't be standing in the way of that, uh, which would be helpful for a lot of our, our ag situation with the uh, ag part the, uh, that we worked out there uh, with the ag worker program? That would save $158 billion in 10 years. So you look at some of these things that institutionally have been help, helping the wealthy and hurting working people, and you're going to find funding uh, for the kind of pension reform, not just for central states, uh, but also for the Pension Guarantee Corporation, uh, where we've seen some other pensions in trouble that you're asking for. And just the last thing I want to say here, do I have a little time? Yeah, that's the last thing. Oh, the very last thing <laughs> um, is that I want to thank uh, the Farmers Union. Uh, the Farmers Union, I think there's some Minnesota folks out there. Um, has, oh, yeah, they're in the back. There they are. They're, that's a we Minnesota. keep them in the back. That would be called a Minnesota loud cheer. <laughs> that, was like, that was like really excited cheer. Um, and my friend Dave Fredrickson, who I know spoke earlier for me at the rally, uh, worked for me for years as my ag guy after retiring as the head of the National Farmers Union. Um, and it was always so fun when he said, I've decided, I guess his wife actually said, I don't like you hanging around the house, please go get a job. Um, and he came and worked for me and I'm so proud that he's here today and did such tremendous work uh, with the National Farmers Union, the Minnesota Farmers Union, and I thank the Farmers Union for standing up for our small farmers every day. Thank you. So, our, our actually, Amy Klobuchar. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A couple more. Okay, more questions. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Happy to have Excuse more. me. I'm not, I love questions. 
Yeah, we actually have a little bit more time, so we're going to oh, we start it with you. Um, okay. I, I'm curious, on, on your anti-monopoly, antitrust stuff, um, how much of this do you see being legislative and how much of it is, is just administrative? I mean, in 2013, when Smithfield was acquired by a Chinese conglomerate, uh, you know, is that the sort, you know, just flatly, should the Obama administration have approved that merger? Um, does it need more authority to, does the next administration need more authority to review mergers? We need more resources in the FTC and we need more resources at the Justice Department. And what's interesting about it, and when you look at some of these mergers that were approved recently, like Dow DuPont and the Monsanto um, uh, proposal, you know, I just think we are getting to be the point where you know you're not going to be able to get a fair deal, right? Because you have less and less competition. And that means you're not going to develop new seeds that might be cheaper or might be better for the environment. You're not going to see that happen. So for me, uh, the first thing you need uh, is those resources. And that's why I have that bill for uh, more resources. But the second thing that you need uh, is an administration uh, that's willing to actually get it done. Now, what happened here, which I find so interesting, is that the president actually ran some on antitrust. He talked about it. But then when he got into office, he sees it as a weapon, right? Did you notice what he did on the AT&T merger? Did he talk about the merger itself? No. He wanted to go after it. Why? Because of CNN, right? He is going after CNN. So instead of saying, let's get some broad changes to our antitrust laws to make this work better for everyday Americans, instead what he does is starts politicizing it so that you really can't get the kind of results. We would love the administration's support for these bills, but that's not what we're getting. So I think you need to have the resources. You need to have some change in laws. Uh, you need to be willing to look back. You look at, think about like the... Uh, a case that was successful, uh, the AT&T uh, breakup, right? That took years to get done. But what happened? We saw a significant lowering of our long distance rates. Um, so you have to be willing to put the resources into it. These are, we now have several trillion dollar companies, right? So you have to have people that are as sophisticated as those corporate tycoons to be able to take this on. You can't just think you're going to be able to do it with three lawyers in a room. You've got to be willing to look at these cases and find out what the best ones are to bring, what the best ones are to oppose. And then I really think, given how the courts are ruling, which is very, very conservative at the Supreme Court level, that it'll take decades to change that. So the best thing to do right now is to change the enforcement, because you'll still get some deals thrown out and things that you can look back and review, and then also change the law. Some folks have called for a moratorium on agricultural mergers for now. Do you think that should be should happen? You know, I would like to look at each merger on its own. You could have a small merger in the agriculture area. Maybe they have a limit on what it is, but I think the best thing is to be able to really take this on in a bigger way. It's not just agriculture. Uh, look at what happened with pharmaceutical prices. Look at what happened with insulin. My guest to the State of the Union uh, was a woman uh, named um, that, that her son, Cindy, and her son actually um, was a diabetic and he was 26 years old. He aged off his parents' insurance and he was a restaurant manager in the suburbs of the Twin Cities. He started rationing insulin and he died after a month after that happened. And that's because the price of insulin is $1,200 a month, a common drug that used to be $18 a vial that's been around for nearly a century. So I, I, I think just picking out certain industries when you've got, you know the online travel when you guys look to try to get deals? Nearly 80% of it is really only two companies. It has all these different names like Expedia and Orbit. It's really only two companies. This is what's going on across America. So I would like to go in a way bigger than, I think, what is the, what's the FF, uh, FFA creed? That the future of agriculture is not in words, but deeds. <laughs> so I would like to really change these standards so we can take a different approach to these companies. Great, thank you okay. so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Amy Klobuchar. All right. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Go Dolphins. I will. He's just full of Minnesota references. It's pretty I, good. I knew your dad. Oh, very good. Well, he's still around. He's 90. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you again. Okay, thank you. See you guys. Okay.
And our next guest then is uh, from the great place called Youngstown, Ohio that gave Iowa Mike and Bobby Stoops. And we have Congressman Tim Ryan with us from Youngstown, Ohio. Thanks for coming. Good Youngstown. Right? Absolutely. Hi. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Anytime I can get thrown in with the Stoops family, I'm in good shape in Iowa. <laughs> right. right, and of course, Northern Iowa uh, is the far better football team than Youngstown State. <laughs> I know that. Right. I know that all too well, sir. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again for coming. Thank and, you. And uh, we appreciate the, the, the effort you took to get here. And I was wondering if you could just tell us, just give us a couple minutes, uh, a summary of your uh, why you're running, or considering running, I should say, <laughs> and uh, what's your vision to uh, kind of revitalize what we know as, I guess, the Rust Belt. Yeah, I appreciate that. So the stock market is as high as it's ever been. Unemployment's as low as it's ever been. And yet there is a chronic level of stress uh, in our society today because of chronic uncertainty. This is economic anxiety, anxiety around, around health care, anxiety around retirement, pension, security. And I think it's time for, you know, a new way of doing things, a new politics, new ideas, a new way to inject some energy into our, our economy. My area that I come from, uh, most recently, we lost the last shift to a General Motors plant that started in 1966 and had about 16,000 workers. It's now idle. And the supplier to that factory uh, Delphi Packard was at about 13,000, and that's down to probably less than 1,000 people now. And so we have seen over the last 30 or 40 years communities like the one I come from and the one I represent get absolutely devastated with, with no plan, no short, mid, or long-range plan in the United States for how we bring it back. And I believe that, that rural America is in the same boat and you know better than I do. And one of the things I think we need to consider, explore here today, and continue to have a conversation as a country, is how do we get these manufacturing centers and some of these urban centers who have been hollowed out in the last 30 or 40 years, tied together politically with rural America, same issues, hospitals closing down, children leaving, kids leaving our communities, opiate ep epidemic, failure to be able to fund our local public services, our local schools. The same problems in Youngstown are the same problems I've read about and am experiencing from your columns and what's happening here. And the only way forward is for us to come together politically. It's the division today in our country that is preventing us from getting to where we need to be. And that's innovating our way out of this thing, caring about each other, loving each other, being concerned about each other, respecting each other, and then building an agenda on that mutual respect and need. That, to me, is what needs to happen in the country. Great, thank you, thank you. So, what is that? So, according to uh, the USDA, uh, this is a very comfortable chair. <laughs> so for me to turn from here all the way over there is a lot of work. I just want everybody. To, I want everyone to Thanks know. Thanks for what putting I'm in the effort. With. You need a little. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to open it up, right? Yeah. Uh, so, Don't ask me anything for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so to your point about manufacturing jobs, according to the USDA, in rural areas, manufacturing jobs account for a greater share of the community's income than in, in urban areas. Uh, but during the Great Recession, we lost a ton of manufacturing jobs in rural America. And even though the unemployment rates come back, those manufacturing jobs have not. It's had a serious effect on the wealth of, of rural America. Yeah. Where did those jobs go? And can anything be done to get them back? And if so, what? A, a lot of them, you know, if you go back 30 years, uh, a lot of them left and they went to Mexico and then to China, uh, at least from my, my experience in Ohio. Lately, it's been more automation. I was just in the, the auto plant a few months back before they got rid of the last shift, and there was uh, two people doing the job of putting the window in the middle, in the front windshield, because there were all the, 
the robotic mm -hmm. parts doing it. It used to be, I think they said, five or six people would do that. Now it was two people and a robot. So a lot of it's automation. I think here's how we get out of it. I'll tell you just a quick story. In 1977, when the steel mills collapsed in Youngstown, Ohio, call it, we call it Black Monday, the technology in the steel mill was pre-World War I. Okay? We got our clock cleaned, and for 40 years, we're still trying to recover. I think what we need to do today is embrace artificial intelligence, embrace additive manufacturing, dominate these industries, infuse these technologies into our older industries who can't afford and don't necessarily know about them. We will jack productivity up, and then the key is cut the worker in on the deal. And we've got to do this because <clears throat> there's an opportunity out there in wind, in solar, in electric vehicles. And right now, we're not winning the future with these. There's going to be there's two, about 1 to 2 million electric vehicles today. By 2030, there's going to be 30 million electric vehicles made. Question is, who's going to make them? Is the United States going to make them or is China going to make them? Who's going to make the batteries that go into the electric vehicles, us or China? Who's going to do the uh, charging stations, us or China? We're losing now. They control 40% of the electric vehicle market. They control 60% of the solar panel uh, uh, market. We've got to get our act together and have public-private partnerships where we're all pushing in the same direction. Our tax code, our research, the Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, local, state, federal, moving in the same direction, and then drive the investment into distressed communities in rural America through incentives. Just to follow up. Can any of that work if you don't reassess trade policy? I mean, when, when the United States did PNTR with China at the end of the 20th century, the economic consensus, the consensus among economists was that it really wouldn't have a job impact. Today, the consensus is that it, it costs at least a million jobs in the United States. Mm. Uh, how, how do you, no matter how much you invest, no matter how many public partnerships you have, can, can that work unless we rewrite the trade rules? I think we need more balanced trade, my own personal opinion. But the key to a successful economy is being on the cutting edge. Yes, at some point, the low-end manufacturing is going to make its way to China. There's no way we're going to be able to compete with that. Who's doing the high-end manufacturing, the advanced manufacturing, the additive manufacturing, who's on the cutting edge of electric vehicles. We need the United States to be. Will we keep everything here? No, we can't. We can't honestly say that, but we're going to keep a heck of a lot more here if we're the ones developing it. There, I'll give you an example. It's not just about manufacturing. It's about having a comprehensive policy around how to grow companies. We think, you know, today, not we, probably us, but some people think if you just cut taxes for the wealthiest people, it's going to trickle down. We've tried that three times. <laughs> Here we are, right? Doesn't work. I met a guy who was President Obama's top manufacturing person. He told me a very interesting story. He said there were 150 companies that came out of MIT a few years back. They used public tax dollars from you and I to develop their product. Of the 150 companies, they, were, they ended up getting about over $4 billion in investment capital. Pretty good. Rest of the story, we had no mechanism in our government to be able to keep them in the United States. All 150 of them are out of the United States now. 70% of them went to China. So the point is, it's not cut taxes and hope things work out. It's how do we build public-private partnerships to continuously grow these new companies. And here's the key. 80% of venture capital today goes to three states, California, Massachusetts, and New York. 9% of it goes to women, and only 2% go to people of color. So if we're going to innovate in agriculture, if we're going to innovate and grow companies in Youngstown, we need the venture capital to come in and have a private sector boost come in too. So this system has got to be constantly and consistently replenishing the jobs, 
because you are going to lose some along the way. And that's why you've got to have a whole of government approach to this. Thank you. Congressman, uh, I don't know, this might not be your strong suit, but uh, we'll try it anyway. Many people think we're planting too much corn to feed to cheap, to, uh, too much corn to feed to cheap hogs or to still into cheap ethanol. Do we need to plant every inch of Iowa to corn and soybeans, or can we finally create a new revenue stream through existing mechanisms, such as the Conservation Stewardship Program, which rewards farmers for conservation practices on working lands? Is there, is there a way for farmers to derive real, regular income by growing grass instead of corn and sucking carbon out of the atmosphere? Can that reorient markets? I, I think there's absolutely no... <laughs> they like my answer. Next, <laughs> yeah, next right. question. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I agree. I think the conservation stewardship uh, program is going is gonna to be essential for us moving forward. That's why you can't have a 15% cut to the USDA. These are the kind of programs that we need to beef up, no pun intended, and we need to... <laughs> And we need to grow because what it does for the earth, and we need to factor when you talk about carbon capture and a Green New Deal and these kind of things, that has to be an essential component of sequestering carbon and using these kind of programs to make it happen. So, Congressman, uh, of all of the people we've had on stage with us today, you're the only one who's not actually running for president yet. So is there anything... You plan to announce today? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I had to ask. Um, so you are a member of the House, and we're here in the 4th Congressional District, which is represented by Steve King. Uh, Steve King. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about division I'm earlier. Okay, so. <laughs> So, uh, Congressman King has been stripped of his uh, committee assignments because of comments he's made about white nationalism, white supremacy, and uh, the House voted to condemn white nationalism, but it hasn't done anything else around the Congressman. Do you think the House needs to go further, whether it's censuring or expelling him or anything like that? I, I thought and I offered for him to be censured by the House. I think that is entirely appropriate not for necessarily one comment that wasn't done on the House floor, but I think for consistent comments over time being made most abhorrently overseas, where you are, and I've traveled a lot overseas, and a lot of the senators and uh, other panelists here did as well, you're representing the United States government. You are an officer of the government. You are a member of Congress, and to make some of these comments there, I think, is entirely inappropriate. I think he's, he's playing along with um, a lot of the race baiting that the, the president uh, participates in, which I think is, is uh, totally unnecessary and insulting and part of the reason why we're so divided as a country. And I think, fortunately, Steve knows my opinion on that. I've been very clear publicly about it. I, I think it's wrong and I think the House should act. And I was disappointed that they didn't. Now we turn again to the audience uh, for questions. And the first is from Phoebe Feiss, a senior at Alta Aurelia High School. Thank you. There were 93 school shootings in 2018, the highest on record. And the United States has six times more gun deaths per capita than Canada. What specific steps will you take to address the epidemic of gun violence in America? Thank you for that question. Um, this is uh, obviously a very, very emotional issue. And let me say that we have not done nearly enough in the United States to prevent this from happening. And there was a, a beautiful display in front of the Capitol this week, which you may have seen on, on social media, where the kids from Parkland, Florida were there and had a beautiful, uh, it was almost like a cemetery where they had crosses everywhere, 
uh, with names, you know, uh, uh, on them, uh, titles on them, and a big sign saying your inaction kills us. And I support background checks. I support researching this. I support closing the Charleston loophole. I support keeping guns out of the hands of, of terrorists uh, who or people who are on the terrorist uh, watch list. So all of the comprehensive uh, firearm reforms that are out there, I, I strongly support. And I say that as someone who hunts. Uh, one of the most enjoyable things that I do with our oldest son, Mason, who's now 16, is uh, we hunt. And I, I just think that there is uh, no reason for anyone who enjoys hunting and the sportsman lifestyle and the camaraderie and tradition that that uh, brings to a family and to a community. There's, they're not mutually exclusive to be able to do that and say we want our kids to feel safe in their schools, not at all. Congressman, I wanted to follow up um, on something I asked Secretary Castro earlier. Uh, in addition to um, you know, gun violence in schools and other sort of mass uh, shootings, uh, there's this problem of suicides, uh, gun deaths by suicide, and this especially hits rural areas. And so how do you address that? Is it reducing access to firearms? Because studies show that when there are just more guns around, people tend to commit suicide more, and that's not something that can always be solved by background checks, or sort of what's your solution to this? Yeah, this is tough, and it actually hits really close to home. A friend of mine uh, just lost his wife just two or three days ago uh, uh, to suicide, in exact same scenario. I think there needs to be a huge education campaign uh, for people um, on how to make sure your uh, firearms are secure and, and, and people can't access them. And I, you, know, you can't have this conversation either without talking about uh, mental health and mental health treatment. I just don't think you can have a, a suicide conversation without really um, I'm talking about that, and rural areas face some of the greatest shortages in our country of, of the kind of mental health treatment. But it's, here, here's the problem I have with the NRA. I, I used to be a supporter, uh, and I gave all my money that the NRA ever gave back to me uh, m many years ago because they did not even want to come to the table to have a conversation. That's what infuriated me. Like, you can't how you watch this on TV and not want to do anything about it. Here's a perfect example where they could play a constructive role in society about trying to help prevent suicides and how to, how to store your gun properly and all the rest. They don't even want to have that conversation. So we have to politically overcome that and dominate it. But I think a, lo a lot of it is securing it and having an education campaign to make sure people know how to, how to do that. Great. Again, returning to the audience, uh, uh, Amelia Marroquin is a mother of three, an immigrant from El Salvador, a Storm Lake School Board member, and a community liaison for Head Start, Even Start with the Storm Lake School System. Thank you for being here. Uh, well, I came to the United States like 13 years after my mom decided to leave us behind. And things got rough in our country due to the war, and safety, of course, was a concern. As a school, member, a school board member, I know many students uh, who are dreamers. I'm sure you know about this program. And one, you know, this, they want to be teachers, they want to be police, police officers, they want to uh, serve in the community as a business leaders, maybe. As you may know, refugees from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, they are escaping from terror and find um, security and jobs under uh, the TPS program. What do you think what we should do with refugees who uh, show up in our borders and how do we protect them as, you know, when they make it to the United States? How long we, uh, we must keep these ambitious dreamers in limbo? Thank you for your question and thank you. <laughs> the, the, the dreamer kids are the most amazing kids. Uh, when we were having this discussion, I had a, a uh, meeting in my office with 10 or 15 of them, and I was crying, they were crying, we were all crying to send the staff to get more Kleenex and bring it into the office, because they, they ep epitomize 
who we want to come to the United States and what they contribute to our country and that diversity is our great strength. We need to take care of the dreamer issue. I think we need to do that immediately. Uh, and that shouldn't be, shouldn't be that difficult. I hope the country hasn't, I hope we as a country can continue to be strong enough to accept refugees coming from war-torn or gang-run countries and they seek to come to the United States to save themselves and their, their daughters from getting sold into the sex trade or their sons getting sold into gangs. I hope we are strong enough as a country to be able to accept them and welcome them into the United States. That to, me, that to me is not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of strength. And the moral authority and the intangibles that that communicates to the world about what kind of country we are far surpass anything else that we can do. I just want to make one other point about what's happening in, in some of the countries in Central America where uh, these refugees are coming from. If President Trump would pick up his presidential daily briefing and look at it and see how we could maybe help solve the problem in these countries before we're forced to deal with it uh, in, uh, on our own borders, we would be well ahead of, of where we are today. These, these people... <laughs> I forget, I probably should have looked at this, but I, for, I forget one of the countries does not even have an ambassador does not even have an ambassador. His cuts, his deep cuts to the State Department are the very programs that would prevent these countries from becoming so destabilized and so violent that people would have to come to the United States in the first place. No one wants to necessarily come here. They come here because they seek a better life. And to come under those conditions, I think, is wrong. But let's, when we talk about leadership at the national level, let's talk about how many problems I want my president to solve before I even hear about them. That's the president's job. I don't want to hear about all these. I got one for you. Thank you. Congressman, uh, one of your colleagues in Congress uh, from California, Ro Khanna, <clears throat> uh, has been talking about uh, trying to move digital jobs into rural areas. It's happening now in Jefferson, Iowa, in partnership with Iowa Central Community College. Right. And he's saying one thing we have to do to unite the country is to put rural America on a level playing field and, and all the wealth and jobs in the digital economy are in North Carolina, Massachusetts, or California. And he is uh, getting companies to come into Iowa in partnership with community colleges to give these kids the digital skills to come out of, with an AA degree and make $75,000 a year in Jefferson, Iowa. Yep. How can we template that all over the country? West Virginia, Kentucky. Ohio. Uh, Ohio. Okay, thank you, you betcha. Large. Youngstown. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Youngstown. go for it. <laughs> uh, Ro Khanna and I... Uh, did a very interesting thing a uh, year and a half ago. I kept meeting people in Silicon Valley, big venture capitalists, and same issue, venture capitals in three states primarily, uh, you know the three. So we got a bus and we put 13 venture capitalists on the bus and we called it the Comeback Cities Tour. And we started in Youngstown and we went to Akron and Detroit and Flint and then we went to see Mayor Pete over in, in South Bend, Indiana. And I literally just got an email today uh, of what of, of an investment that's happening in Flint. We started in Youngstown what's called the Comeback City Capital Fund that now has two or three million dollars in it to help fund seed money, most of the money coming from outside of Ohio uh, that's going into this fund to help seed new businesses. This is the new model. How do we use the government the tax code and every incentive we possibly can have and put into place, incentivize the private sector to make investments in distressed communities or rural America. That's how this is going to happen. It includes government action with regard to broadband, with regard to community colleges, with regard to infrastructure, also with regard to refurbishing our downtowns. Because if you don't have the sense of place for young people, 
and people to want to stay in that community, like an old theater, a downtown, a jazz club, a coffee shop, a river walk, a bike trail. This is all, this is what I'm talking about. You've got to have a comprehensive agenda from every aspect of the government pushing in the same direction. That's what we're lacking now is that big, big vision. Roe is on it. Roe is one of the leaders and, and him and I get along really, really well <coughs> around figuring out how to do this. It's, this is doable. This is, there are ideas in Iowa around agriculture and food processing and production and all of that that I never heard of in Youngstown, Ohio. And when we brought the Silicon Valley people to Youngstown and Akron, they were looking at our startup businesses in our incubators and in our uh, accelerators. And they were like, we never thought that there would be a business to, because we never knew of the problem that the business was trying to address because that's not a problem in Mountain View, California. It's a problem in Youngstown, right? So how do we get your capital with our ideas, whether distressed community or rural America, and we take off and the government has got to be more innovative, more creative, have more of an imagination to get this thing done. This is why we got to come together. We're sitting here fighting with each other and going, boy, that'd be a great idea. How do we do that? You know, and it's happening in one little place. Right. I think the next five or 10 years of the United States is going to be, how do we find these ideas that are already working around the country? How do we scale them up? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Just come together, get the government operating in the 21st century again, which it doesn't, and, and let's go. And you laugh, but it's true. It's true. I mean, and as Democrats, we need to be very critical of the government because it's not getting the job done for us. It's not doing it. Good. Well, I'm curious. So uh, when you talk about coming together, uh, we've heard a lot about bipartisanship today from different people. I mean, you're dealing with a Republican Party that denied President Obama a Supreme Court justice appointee. Uh, that tried to block basically every single piece of legislation the last Democratic president tried to advance, yeah. that openly stated they wanted to, that their top priority was making him a one-term president. Uh, I, I mean, what is the universe in which the Republican Party is going to cooperate to do any of these things? I, I, I was there for all that. I got the, <laughs> I got the emotional wounds to prove it. Uh, it was a brutal time. It was a brutal time. I think that we need to put together an agenda that captures the 65% of the American people. And we need to bring that agenda together. I think we, we try to bring everybody together to the extent we can, but force Republicans to politically have to, to move the ball down the field for us. Because I don't think they can continue I, I, they're squirming like crazy now uh, o over the Affordable Care Act that the president's uh, putting forward. A lot of Republicans are getting really, especially the ones that happen to be up in 2020. I don't know if that's a coincidence as to why they're so nervous about it or not, but they're, they're very nervous. So I think if we can provide an agenda that talks about the kind of things that we were talking about, that can unite rural agenda. I mean, we should be able to come to rural America, given everything that's been going on, not, not made a profit in the last five years, the, the price of the of products. The, I'm, I'm looking at this system because <laughs> I'm reading to come here and trying to... Yeah. I'm looking what's happening in rural America with regard to the concentration of power and the monopolies. And you know what we call this in Youngstown? It's a scam. Yeah. It's an absolute, <laughs> absolute scam. So, so to your point, if we come to rural America with a real agenda about opening markets, about investing in you know, conservation stewardship programs and like making sure that we're, we're taking care of uh, rural America, and we have innovative ideas on how to build out the economy, both manufacturing and ag, let's go and brag and say, we got a plan for you. And it's the same plan that's needed in Youngstown. Can we please put a coalition together and take this country to the next level? Can we please get everybody on the same page? Because we're all, we're all suffering, we're all suffering from the same thing. And I think you go there. I mean, part of the problem in 2016 was Democrats did not even go to rural America. 
I don't know what they, if they came here, but in Ohio, there was not a real robust rural uh, outreach effort, a rural, exciting rural agenda. But I think if you talk about what Ro Khan is talking about, what I'm talking about, innovations within smaller communities, rebuilding small towns. When I first ran for state senate, I had a palm card. I just ran across it because I was cleaning out my basement. Tim Ryan for state senate in Ohio. You know what my number one issue on the palm card was? Renovate the Robbins Theater. It's an old theater in the downtown. I was young, I was 26. And it was renovate the Robbins Theater because young people were leaving like crazy because in part there wasn't, weren't jobs, but there wasn't anything to do either. And that was the big theater that we wanted to get renovated. That was a top thing on my palm card. Those are the kind of things that we, we need to go to people who voted. And, and here's why I think I could maybe be helpful in this process. Uh, Trump voters voted for me and they voted for Trump. They voted for President Obama and me. Fortunately, I'm getting votes both ways. I'm happy about that. But we, these voters can come back home to us. And if we have a strong rural agenda, we can put this together and get them voting for us, given everything going on, and, and I think push Republicans who will be in the Senate primarily to move on some of this stuff. I think it's doable. Gotcha. You betcha. You betcha. <laughs> Congressman, thanks a million for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Congressman Appreciate Tim Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good question. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's the end of our program today. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks to everyone who tuned in on our live stream. Um, we have a quick announcement for those of you who are here in the audience from the Vice President of the Iowa Farmers Union.